Living with Risk, Balancing Autonomy with Protection from Harm. This video is part of Family Councils Ontario's Osteoporosis and Fracture Prevention Resource Package for Family Councils in Long-Term Care. This video will explore balancing the positive benefits from taking risks against the negative effects of attempting to avoid risk altogether. This video will provide residents, substitute decision makers, power of attorneys, and others with information on how to discuss and negotiate appropriate risks. This video will focus on osteoporosis as an example of an issue affecting long-term care residents that needs both risk and reward considered. Osteoporosis is a disease characterized by low bone mass and deterioration of bone tissue which can lead to increased risk of fracture. When it comes to osteoporosis and fracture prevention, we always need to keep in mind a resident's values and preferences. From the Long-Term Care Homes Act. A long-term care home is primarily the home of its residents and is to be operated so that it is a place where they may live with dignity and in security safety and comfort, and have their physical, psychological, social, and spiritual and cultural needs adequately met. In meeting these needs, we must consider quality of life. Only a resident or a substitute decision maker or power of attorney, when appropriate, can fully determine the quality of life for residents. When it comes to the issue of osteoporosis and fracture prevention, quality of life is an essential consideration. The legal premise of risk is the same as the medical premise in that choosing to take a risk is legally acceptable. In Ontario, provided a person is capable, they can choose to take a significant risk or in the opinions of others, make a poor decision. The same is true when it comes to the issue of osteoporosis and fracture prevention for long-term care residents. Ontario's legal system places great value on individual autonomy. We respect people's rights to make decisions for themselves. Our laws strive to balance autonomy with protecting vulnerable people. Most of us want to be able to make decisions about our own lives and bodies. And taking that away from someone is a huge intrusion on their liberty. The same applies to long-term care residents. The idea of informed consent is to allow the person to take risks, provided it is an educated decision. Under the Healthcare Consent Act, there are several things that must be explained to patients, residents, and substitute decision makers as part of the informed consent process. Risks, benefits, side effects, alternatives, and so on. Declining a wheelchair is not so different than declining medical treatment in terms of individuals balancing what is personally most important to them. It is essential to have ongoing discussions about what risks are considered acceptable to that resident. For example, accepting or refusing new medications or surgery, or using a walker as opposed to a wheelchair. My mother was diagnosed with Lewy body dementia. We managed on our own for a few years, but she eventually moved to long-term care. I visited every day. She took minimal medications for years, but we ultimately found that a very low dose of a pain medication significantly helped mediate both agitation and helped her sleep. She used a walker rather than a wheelchair because she loved to walk before and after moving to long-term care. A walker gave her a little independence and freedom at a time when there was little else she could control. Making these decisions as her power of attorney was difficult because I was always concerned about her risk of falling. Lewy body dementia is a particularly difficult disease to treat, and long-term care staff did not want to use medication and preferred she was in a wheelchair to reduce the risk of falls. 
my focus was always on my mom's quality of life in terms of how many good days she had rather than how long we could prolong her life. My mother eventually had a serious fall and broke her hip trying to get to the bathroom in the middle of the night. Staff wanted to transfer her to hospital. After consultation with my mom's neurologist, we opted to keep my mother comfortable in long-term care. I felt my mother would not survive the chaos of the emergency department or the anesthesia for hip repair surgery. I was certain she would die in hospital if we transferred her. She certainly didn't have the strength to tolerate a painful and lengthy rehabilitation. My mother died at the age of 81 years in the place she considered home. In my experience, long-term care home staff may make decisions to reduce risk without taking an individual approach to each resident. The decisions about risk versus benefit are complex and difficult to make. POAs must feel empowered to know that they have the authority to advocate for their loved ones and ensure that the decisions are made align with their loved ones' wishes. Often decisions we make trying to balance quality of life with the negative effects of eliminating risk are a constant and profound challenge. There are times where it is both legal and appropriate to take certain risks. For substitute decision makers, under the law, either the Healthcare Consent Act or Substitute Decision Act as applicable, they must decide based on the resident's prior capable wish, if known and applicable to the circumstances, and then best interests. So we need to consider the objective and medical information, but also things like the person's values, wishes, and beliefs. Within the right circumstances, risk can be beneficial. The law requires us to consider what is important to the resident, and not just what will keep the person safest. We need to think holistically about what is best for the individual, and balance the risk of injury with what the resident wants in terms of quality of life. We need to understand the risks and benefits of an intervention or action, and focus on what improves quality of life, not just clinical outcomes. We need to enable people to take the risks they choose based on best available information. So maybe a walker and not a wheelchair or not treating a urinary tract infection right at the beginning. We need to recognize that residents are individuals and tailor interventions to their needs, not just what might be considered safest. And we need to thoroughly discuss the possible outcomes of an intervention, action, or decision. In 1999, when my mother was 79, she fell on the sidewalk near her home and broke her elbow. After surgery to repair her elbow with a metal hinge and plate, she was tested for osteoporosis. The test revealed that she was at an extreme increased risk of having a fracture. Shortly after her recovery, she moved from her home into an apartment in a senior's building. 2006, she had a spontaneous break of her left femur. Once again, she had surgery and a metal nail was inserted. In late 2007, mom had fractured ribs. She had not fallen and it was assumed that she had probably sneezed or coughed. She moved into long-term care in May 2008. While in long-term care, she got out of bed one night and fell. This time she broke her right femur. More surgery, and another nail needed to be inserted. My brother and I were aware of mom's wishes regarding her quality of life, so prior to her surgery, we discussed what the doctors should do if there were complications during the surgery. Mom is now 97 years old and uses a wheelchair to get around. My mom has a high quality of life and is very happy. She is able to participate in all of the activities that she likes to do in her long-term care home, like exercises, art classes, bingo, and musical entertainment. I worry about the possibility of another fall because I know that if she falls, she will probably break something. If that happens, it will be my responsibility to ensure that her treatment plan provides her with a high quality of life. As a result of my mom's medical history, and since osteoporosis can be hereditary, my doctors have been proactive in scheduling me 
for bone density testing and prescribing medication for the treatment of osteoporosis. I have been diagnosed with osteopenia. I am very aware how important it is to manage osteopenia and osteoporosis to ensure that I will continue to live a full, healthy life. I may have to take informed risks to maintain or improve my quality of life, similar to the decisions that my mom has had to make. My goal is to be as good as her or better when I am her age. In closing, we'd like to leave you with this quote. Reflect on it as you have conversations with your loved one on how they would like to live with risk. The person who risks nothing, does nothing, has nothing, is nothing, and becomes nothing. He may avoid suffering and sorrow, but he simply cannot learn and feel and change and grow and love and live. Leo Biscaglia. Thank you to the following who helped in the production of this video. Daria and Linda for sharing their stories of how their loved ones were impacted by osteoporosis and fracture and how they've chosen to live with risk. Lisa Feldstein for information on the legal definition of risk and the Geriatric Education and Research in Aging Sciences, JERA Center. For more information and resources on osteoporosis and fracture prevention, visit Family Councils of Ontario online at www.fco.ngo.